Get a Book Dot today presents Strike Battleship Argent, Book One in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2016. Stand by for action. Want new bonus chapters? Of course! Everyone wants bonus chapters! If you like what you see in here, give us a super thanks. Buttons are below every video. Every super thanks goes directly to new science fiction. Don't miss our action premieres where you can enjoy the story live. Want to rank up and get special recognition? Become a channel member. You might even become an honorary Skywatch Marine. Join us, subscribe, hit the notification bell, like and comment, and don't forget to visit the bookstore where you will find my latest books and one-of-a-kind officially licensed gear. All ahead, battle speed! Chapter 11 Captain on the Bridge Hunter took the center chair and lashed up his emergency harness. Zoni, tell me everything I don't already know. The signals officer was already hard at work, her fingers dancing over the impossibly elaborate bank of controls at the communications station. She wore old-fashioned over-the-ear headphones equipped with a small boom mic near one cheek. Honora, get Flight 1 on the box. I want two jacks and a T-Hawk in space in 60 seconds. Have Flight 2 ready a nemesis and park them on Station 1 megaclick off our starboard wing. Everyone stays scanner passive until further instructed. Affirmative, Commander Doverly swiveled in her chair and began coding the flight orders. Helm, all stop. Thrusters at station keeping. Aye, sir. Helm answering all stop. CIC, report status of Kilo X-Ray 1. Contact slowing in space. Range now 15 million miles. Vessel type still unidentified. Energy emissions suggest a warship in the 80 ton range. No active signals. He can see us and he knows we can see him, Hunter mused. Skywatch, what have you got? We confirm CIC's report. They're still closing, but they're also slowing down. Sir, Flight 2 reports Nemesis 8 standing by to launch, Doverly reported. Space Force Patrol Cavalier 11 is standing by on rails 2 and 3. Hunter turned back to the tactical display. Signal STC rails are green. Launch all alert spacecraft. Doverly switched the launch board over and signaled clear space. The twin-engine Yellow Jacket fighter's cockpit was filled with cool, oxygen-rich air. The winds of the overbuilt fusion engines on either side of its main section rose in unison as the pilot's tack suit inflated and normalized the ionization of its internal fluid circulation. Yellow Jacket 10, this is Skywatch. Space Lane Control has cleared the rails. Stand by for full power launch in 5, 4, 3. The cylindrical magnetically charged rail tunnel around the angry-looking little attack craft began to thrum with millions of volts of barely restrained energy. The pilot saluted the armored and receded bunker right next to the flightway, and the rail operator returned the salute just before the count reached zero. The pilot's anti-inertial circulation went to full pressure as his body was slammed into the flight couch. Yellow Jacket 10 was pulled down the 90-yard rail tunnel by impossibly strong magnetic forces until it was literally fired out the port side of Flight 1 at a speed of more than 350 miles per hour. Its powerful engines kicked in and rocketed the heavily armed little ship up to nearly 2,000 miles per hour in a matter of seconds. Moments later, Yellow Jacket 11 and T-Hawk Black performed a textbook rendezvous at the innermost combat space patrol range of 400 miles and began to circle the Argent. Beneath the mighty battleship, the same ritual played out again, this time for the much larger Nemesis Electronic Warfare Corvette. Her crew of five harnessed themselves to their shock frames before the rail launcher blasted the sleek vessel into a heading towards the starboard edge of the Argent's command area. It banked its way through a tight maneuver before literally disappearing into the inky vacuum and vanishing from the Argent's instruments. Only her pinpoint directional LOAS data links remained active, transmitted across a shifting hyper-accelerated laser impossible to detect from anywhere in space except a point directly between Nemesis 8 and her mothership. The data link gave her both communications and telemetry without alerting any hostile ships to her position. Combat Space Patrol on station and standing by, Captain, Anora reported. Very good. Zoni, have ice station start turning this region of space into Channel 3. Ops. Zoni turned to face the captain's chair but didn't say anything. She was listening intently, one hand on her headphones and staring at the floor. Zoni? She held up her hand, as if trying to quiet sounds that might make it hard to hear. Woo! 
Hunter stopped himself. He knew that look Zoni had. She was doing that thing where she could figure out what note on a piano would match the sound of a door creak down the hall in the building next door. Captain, I have a microwatt strength signal coming from Barker's asteroid. It sounds like a human voice. They're hailing us, Zoni said without looking up. Hunter stared at the tactical plot. Barker's asteroid was far beyond the unidentified contact on the opposite side of the Argent's projected Z-axis. Hailing us, at this range? Commander Doverly performed some quick calculations before getting to her feet. That's impossible. We would have detected active scanners, even then they'd have trouble identifying us. Let's hear it, Lieutenant, Hunter said quietly. The channel popped and sizzled with static and background noise. Buried deep in the electronic haze, there was a thin, tinny-sounding voice clearly audible. Hunter couldn't tell who the voice belonged to, but it sounded for all the world like a 1940s radio broadcast. Argent, you're walking into a trap. It's a setup. Run before it's too late. Chapter 12 Sir, the Marine snapped to attention and saluted. The officer returned the gesture. What's on your mind, Corporal? Major Lucas Moody was standing at the lectern in the squadron briefing room working his way through equipment readiness reports. The unsheathed sword of the Marine Mechanized Infantry's crest filled the wall behind him. Sir, well, see, the guys and me, we've been talking and... Just say it, Corporal. The Second Marines are a team, commanding officer to gas can. The Major's encouragement didn't seem to do much for the young Marine's uncomfortable expression. Well, sir, I found out the skipper's just a little older than me, and I was wondering if that's, you know, a normal thing in the fleet? He scratched the side of his nearly shaved head with a confused look. You have plans to join the officer corps, Marine? No, I mean no, sir. I'm pretty happy just being one of the guys. He chuckled nervously. My mom would disown me if I messed up my marks in basics, sir, but I was just wondering because I went to flight school with Jason Hunter. I was one of the men he rescued when he won the Sky Shield Legion. He charged an enemy frigate squadron in a single-seat yellow jacket fighter. They went this way, he went that way. He made it. They didn't. I... I didn't know that, sir. Most people don't. The skipper isn't the type to brag. There's no man alive I'd rather have on the bridge of any ship I'm taking to war than Jason Hunter. If you went missing, Marine, he'd bring every man and woman in this command with him looking for you. For whatever it was worth, the look on Major Moody's face seemed to provide the young man some comfort. The corporal stood at attention again and saluted. Moody returned the salute again, and the Marine dismissed himself. Chapter 13 As heroic as Major Moody made the young captain sound, at that particular moment he didn't look like he was ready to slay any dragons. Captain Hunter was pacing the bridge of his ship while his executive officer and signals officer watched with concerned expressions. I'm tempted to call it a ruse, he said, looking up at the massive tactical display of Gitarn Sector 8. On the port side of the Argent's avatar was Alert 3, consisting of two fighters and a Tarantula Hawk gunship. On the opposite side was an indicator for the last known position of Nemesis 8, an electronic warfare corvette stationed nearby to assist the much larger battleship in the event hostilities broke out. And by the looks of things, Hunter thought, they just might. Although his flight decks were still at general quarters, Hunter had ordered the rest of the ship to alert Condition 1. Unidentified contact Kilo X-Ray 1 had neither advanced nor retreated in the last three hours, and Hunter remembered well the lesson he learned in officers' training about crews that remained at high alert for too long. At this range, there's no way to tell. I can't give you any details on the hardware they're using or why we're getting such weird signal attenuation, Zoni replied. They've set it to automatic broadcast, so either they know we're here or they know we're coming. Still doesn't make sense, Honora Doverly countered. They called us by name, no designator. There wasn't even an attempt to conceal our identity or theirs. They just fire off this minimum bandwidth signal, hoping we're here to receive it and then tell us to run? What about them? Barker's asteroid isn't exactly well known for its five-star accommodations. I'll give you that much, Commander, Hunter replied with his back still turned. If I was crashed on that spinning junkyard, I'd be more concerned about survival than setting up warnings for ships I don't even know are... It hit Zoni and Jason at exactly the same moment. He turned around and her face gradually lit up into a delighted expression of sudden discovery. 
What if the Admiral knows we're coming? Hunter pointed at Lieutenant Tixia in a wordless gesture of agreement and turned to his executive officer, whose frown indicated she wasn't quite as enthusiastic about their electromagnetic sleuthing skills. A flag officer would not set up an emergency beacon and start broadcasting ship names in the clear, Doverly said. Look at this. She rose from her seat and walked over to stand by the captain at the forward bridge tactical display. Here is Alert 3. They got the same signal we did only a few hundredths of a second sooner. Nemesis 8 is over here. They got the same message a few ticks later. That means if Barker's asteroid is broadcasting the signal, it's omnidirectional. With all due respect to the admiral and the captain, sir, it takes a special kind of imbecile to start listing ship names in a clear frequency omnidirectional broadcast with hostiles in the area. Yeah, the next thing you know they'll be asking us to confirm our position, Lucas Moody added. He was leaning against the edge of the main bridge entrance portal behind the tactical console and munching on a piece of celery. Exactly, Honora said. Whoever that is, they aren't Skywatch. All right, let's come at this from the other direction. Kilo X-Ray 1 is between us and the signal. They must be getting it too, but they've been sitting out there for three hours. They're not moving. No emissions, no energy readings, nothing. What's their purpose here, drawing a line and daring us to cross it? Why wouldn't they respond to the signal? Maybe the signal is bait, Zoni speculated. Could be, but that ship is no match for Argent, Lucas said. Why draw a line in the sand if the guy's just going to push you down and step on you? Maybe that's why they're trying to stay out of reach, Hunter mused, looking back up at the tactical display. I wish I could get a line on their weaponry and loadout. If that's a missile cruiser, a couple squadrons of jacks could carve it up like a pheasant. But if they're loaded up with energy weapons... How sharp his teeth are only matters if he bites us, Commander Dauverly said. Want me to take a flight of paladins out there and kick the door in, Skipper? Moody asked. I've got a tougher job for you and the boys, Major, Hunter replied. When the time comes, I want you to set a squadron down on Barker's asteroid and find out who's playing with the radio. Bridge to sensor section. The overhead intraship comlink switched over and a pleasant female voice answered. Sensor section, Ensign Kavanaugh. Do we have anything on the Dunkirk we can get through passives? Radiation trail, reactor signature, last known course, anything? Negative, Captain. Unless we go active, we can't turn the clock back that far. Nemesis 8 could probably do it, but covering the sector yard by yard is going to take a while. How much of a while? At least a couple of days, Captain. Gitarin is a big box of rocks, and every asteroid out there is a special signal reflecting interference-producing snowflake. Hunter ran his fingers through his light-colored hair. Well, I'll say this much. Whoever decided to drive me up a wall today sure planned ahead. Bridge out. The bridge crew quietly continued monitoring their instruments and waiting for orders. Hunter paced. All right, we didn't fly all the way out here to watch the paint dry. I want the Dunkirk found, and right now the prime suspect in her disappearance is Kilo X-Ray 1 bearing 319. Hunter fell into his command chair and punched the intraship. Alert 3, this is Charlie Oscar. I want a loud ID pass on target Kilo X-Ray 1. Acknowledge. Yes, sir, came the confident reply. Hunter switched the transmitter. Nemesis 8, blanket the sector. I want everything dark. A moment later, the tactical display went haywire. Ships began appearing and disappearing all over visible space. Zoni indicated loss of contact with the Barker asteroid radio signal. As the tiny electronic warfare corvette began filling the spectrum with noise, the Argent bridge crew watched carefully as the trio of attack vessels designated Alert 3 veered towards the unidentified contact. Chapter 14 Yili was engrossed in her work. The Argent engineering section had to be seen to be believed. Reactor 7 towered over the assembly chamber where the chief engineer had set up shop. The lieutenant was seated at a workstation observing changes in the chemical residue from alternative fuel mixtures and absently poking at a salad. After her quiet and unheralded arrival as the new officer in charge of the entire engineering staff aboard the Argent, the other crew members weren't too sure what to make of her. It took some time to get her to mention her last name was Curtis. Some of the junior officers suggested a nickname of Annie, while others preferred Girl with a Gun, as she seemed to be permanently armed with a heavy blaster disruptor pistol in a low holster on one side. Engineers were almost never armed. For one thing, they had enough tools and equipment to carry around. 
For another, most of the engineering crew had long since let their rifle and pistol skills wither. As crew aboard a Skywatch starship, they were required to pass basic training, but once they got their ship and assignment, most found themselves far too involved in their work to worry about regular visits to a rifle range for training. Besides, there were always sentry marines posted. During the first few shift changes, and especially during the battle drill, Lieutenant Curtis had started a habit of wandering around the section and arriving on the scene of less than successful efforts by other engineering crew members, precisely when the raised eyebrow of a senior officer would do the most good. She would rarely speak, she would only observe, add a quiet mmm, and then leave. At first, the engineering crews thought she was being critical, but she never followed up. After a few rounds of this, they weren't quite sure what she was doing. The results, however, could not be argued with. Engineering crews would start obsessively checking their own work to avoid the nod and the mmm from the chief engineer, and in the process, in the space of scarcely a day, both efficiency and productivity had started to climb. Without a word, the OCE officer had turned the sprawling department into the beginnings of a self-checking, self-supportive team. All this was just fine with the lieutenant, of course. What she really wanted was peace and quiet so she could learn the ins and outs of the Argent's reactor array and power systems as quickly as possible. One thing her new ship was not was a yellow jacket fighter. The assembly bay for multi-axis laser-activated MALA fusion reactor number 7 was appropriately spacious. Most of the atmosphere-exposed surfaces were coated with white anti-static paint to help prevent charge buildup from the ionized coolant mixture. The von Mansfried design reactor chamber resembled the base of an enormous grain silo surrounded by waste-level control consoles and the emergency isolation shield mechanisms. Two levels of gantry walkways were constructed overhead, each designed to grant crew members access to the baffles, electronics access panels, and emergency facilities at assembly levels 2 and 3. Each was 35 feet higher than the one below it. A ladder extended from Gantry 3 to the chamber escape hatch at the ceiling level more than 12 stories above the deck. It was impressive enough on its own. What Yilly and all other chief engineers knew was politicians and press were always humbled when they learned Citadel-class capital ships like the Argent had seven more just like it, each one capable of a sustained output of 40 megawatts and theoretical burst capacities of up to half a gigawatt. Reactor 7 was currently quietly operating at a fairly reserved 1.5% of full capacity, with most of its energy being used by Flight Deck 3 to cycle fighter and gunship battle screens for testing. Other engineers occasionally wandered through the Reactor 7 assembly room, most carrying man-portable pieces of testing equipment from one place to the next. Some of the heavier stuff was mounted on wheeled trucks for convenience, and some of the really heavy pieces of equipment and tools were transported by driven vehicles. Unfortunately, none of those crew members, engineers, or patrols noticed the shadowy humanoids gathering on Gantry 3. Their plans had been underway for several minutes without detection. Some of the Marine Guards had been lulled into a false sense of security by the formidable nature of the automatic intruder alert systems, and as a result, they had allowed their powers of observation to become rusty. The fact that everyone would later agree save the ship was that Reactor 7 was also being guarded by Major Moody's low-key guards for Lieutenant Yilly Curtis. Intruder! Yilly looked up with a start and saw one of the incognito marines dive towards the deck alarm. The soft sounds of beam weapons fire filled the chamber and blinding lances of white light rained down from the overhead gantry. The young marine never made it to the alert console, the boarding party knew they had only a few moments delay before the entire ship would know they were there, so they put those moments to deadly use. The other of Lieutenant Curtis's undercover guards actually managed to return fire before he was driven behind an auxiliary power generator to avoid being vaporized where he stood. The next group of crewmen to enter Reactor 7's assembly chamber came under immediate attack. The one leading the truck carrying oil and fuel residue from Paladin landing mechanisms was instantly vaporized by a center of mass shot to the chest. The others had more fortunate cover positions behind the truck and managed to escape the chamber altogether. The lieutenant moved quicker than most would have believed she could. She ducked under her workstation and swiftly moved towards a cover position behind Auxiliary Power 2. She was only three yards from safety when one of the intruders confronted her at deck level. All Yili could see was a dark humanoid form of some kind wearing what might have been an all-black tack suit. Whatever it was, it seemed equally surprised to find anyone so close. The intruder drew a bladed weapon and lunged, driving the point down towards Yili's back. 
Argent's chief engineer ducked into the motion and slammed both her fists down on her opponent's instep. She actually felt at least two bones break. There was a muffled cry of pain before both of them crashed to the floor in a rolling struggle. The lieutenant's combat training took over, and in moments she had driven the intruder's knife into his chest. She dragged the body with her behind Auxiliary 2 and activated her comlink. On the bridge, Zoni was busy punching a hole through Nemesis 8's interference to establish a solid channel with Alert 3. When the indicator for an intraship hail directly to her designator came through, she answered it right away. Bridge. Signals. Yili's voice was an urgent whisper. Zoni, this is Yili in Reactor 7. Intruder alert. I say again, intruder alert. They've shot two of my men and wounded a third. I need Mu to deploy assault teams at all the strike points on the port side of Reactor 6. Acknowledge. Affirmative, Jack 4. Hold the fort. We're sending the cavalry. Zoni switched intraship communications over to wired channels and activated an EM communications blackout. Dominique responded with a series of security options, which the signals officer activated on her own authority. Captain, we have an intruder alert in Reactor 7. Communications are black. Engineering is requesting backup. Hunter turned to Moo and shouted, Go! The Major scrambled back down the Deck 1 corridor towards the Magneto lifts, activating his comlink as he ran. It detected the ship's communications blackout and shifted to one of three pre-selected frequencies not affected by the electronic noise the rest of the ship's repeaters were broadcasting at maximum power. This is Tango Charlie. Repel borders Reactor 7. Repel borders Reactor 7. Assault armor to all strike points. Anora, sound general quarters all decks. Intruder protocols. Stand by environmental defenses. Neek, let's start with Protocol 1. Affirmative, Captain. Signals has already activated all automatic security protocols. Three cheers for efficiency, Hunter said. Zoni, give me a tactical view of Deck 29, port side aft. Overlay locations of all biological life signs and then subtract anyone wearing a comlink. Acknowledged. Tactical on screen. The captain had just gotten out of his chair to take a closer look when intraship wired communications channels sounded the alert tone. Bridge, this is Skywatch. Kilo X-Ray 1 is on an intercept course bearing 321 range 7 million miles and closing. Zoni, scrub alert 3's ID pass. Scramble formation and stand by for attack orders. Bridge, CIC, missiles in space and tracking. Vampire, vampire, vampire. Chapter 15. Aboard the Alert. Three gunship, Junior Lieutenant Maxwell Abey successfully ordered an evasive maneuver that rocketed T-Hawk 6 into a diving roll. The rest of his five-man crew breathed a machine-filtered sigh of relief as they silently thanked him for not listening to the steady stream of complaints about orders to keep their shock harnesses threaded and fastened. Moments later, a formation of lethal warhead-tipped missiles ripped through space directly through their previous course. Right behind them was the still unidentified Kilo X-ray contact. Target acquisition! We're being lit up! Flight Specialist Katza shouted. Pivot on your bearings and bring our forward screens to double power, Abi replied. The relatively tiny gunship turned to face the enemy cruiser's starboard edge like a vicious little insect ready to take on a cat. Take your best shot, you son of a... Red and white beams exploded from the emplacements on the cruiser's upper hull. Each shot pounded and ripped against T-Hawk 6. Her overloaded battle screens glowed angrily. But like an experienced prize fighter, the gunship took the punches, absorbed as much of the energy as she could, and struck back. The Tarantula Hawk hunter-killer gunship was second only to the Paladin multi-role hull in its formidable array of combat abilities. Among the many things a T-Hawk could do was convert a limited amount of enemy weapons energy to capacitance potential, and then feed it back into its own short-range defenses. In other words, the more you shoot at a T-Hawk, the more ammunition you're giving it to shoot back at you. This, among other things, was one reason the little gunships were so damn annoying. They were built like little bricks of ablative armor and bristling with nasty weapons. Absent a truly overwhelming center of mass shot with a hypervelocity ship killer missile, they were virtually impossible to disable completely, much less destroy outright. T-Hawks were roughly three times the mass and volume of a fighter, but could bring as much as four times the equivalent firepower to bear. T-Hawk 6 lived up to its reputation moments after being staggered in space by the enemy cruiser's short-range energy weapons. The tiny gunship opened up with its brawler cannons and pounded away at the much larger vessel's shields. 
The cruiser shuddered with the punishment, and an alarming number of its armor plates buckled under the first barrage. For a few moments, the two ships traded punches like it was the twelfth round of a mismatched and unsanctioned bout in a speakeasy basement. What the enemy ship didn't realize was T-Hawk 6 was only one part of a three-ship alert group. Long before grappling with the gunship, enemy fire control had completely lost track of the two Yellow Jacket fighters that had peeled off evading the cruiser's missiles. With the Nemesis Corvette blasting EM interference all over the sector, by the time their point defenses recovered, it was too late. The rest of Alert 3 came screaming in on the cruiser's ventral Z-axis like diving peregrine falcons. The angry-looking little ships were no match for the cruiser in a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight, but that wasn't what made Yellow Jackets threatening. These two second-generation fighters were armed with the most advanced torpedoes ever deployed aboard a core ship of the line. Their technical designation was the Mark V Gravity-Activated Rail-Launched Oxygen Compression Torpedo. Jack pilots called them Fives. In keeping with the traditional playing card metaphor of the Yellow Jacket fraternity, the saying went that, a pair of fives beats anything. The reason these particular weapons were so devastating was they took full advantage of the pressure differential and consequential energy potential between the vacuum of space and the pressurized interior of a starship. Any ship with a combustible element in its atmosphere mix was vulnerable to a five torpedo. Given the traditional realities and requirements of biology, there were few species with ship atmospheres without at least one energetic element, and that's all the torpedo's warhead needed to unleash a fiery vengeance on everything exposed to that atmosphere. Twin Fox 5s separated from their launchers and locked targeting frequencies with identification data pulled from all five core ships in the vicinity. In a space of a few nanoseconds, the onboard logic systems confirmed to six decimal places of certainty the big enemy cruiser in front of them was the correct target. At that moment, acquisition alarms were likely sounding a hellish din on the ship's bridge, but at this range, such a sound was only useful to warn crew members their world was about to literally turn upside down. Both torpedoes went hypermock in the same instant and slammed into the ventral hull of the enemy cruiser just forward of her main engine cowlings. The dense points of the torpedoes punctured the coated metal frame and buckled the ship's support structure in several places. Twin deck-shattering explosions ripped twisted chunks of scorched metal out of the vessel's interior and covered everything visible with a light-absorbing grayish paint-like substance. From outside the ship, it looked like someone had popped a huge black bubblegum bubble all over the inside and outside of the ship. The pause lasted for about four seconds. Then the ship began to bleed atmosphere, and what started out as black goo very rapidly turned into what appeared to be molten white-hot glass. Plasma began to stream from the enemy cruiser's aft section, as its energy dampeners and shields fought mightily to control the unusual chemical and magnetic reactions taking place both inside and outside its primary hull. Had the proper equipment been present, it would have registered the perfect conditions forming in the breach between the inner atmosphere and the hard vacuum of space. At the point where the hull had been punctured, a highly compressed combination of a temperature inversion and a bubble of pure oxygen had formed, with all the other trace elements drained out of the atmosphere and into the chemicals left behind by the armor-piercing explosions. The molecular clock ticked until finally the ionization reached a tipping point and a small bolt of lightning arced across the enemy ship's deck, igniting a dangerously compressed oxygen hypernova. Almost exactly five seconds after impact, twin explosions lit up space for two million miles. Staggered, off course, and bleeding from nearly a dozen hull breaches, the enemy cruiser somehow miraculously righted itself and bore down on DSS Argent. T-Hawk 6 pursued, engaging the larger vessel's aft point defense in a running firefight towards Captain Hunter's command. Chapter 18 Lieutenant Yili Curtis knew what the intruders had done. She knew what was happening to her ship, and she had to admit it was a beautifully executed act of pure sabotage. Argent hadn't taken the enemy cruiser seriously enough, and it was about to pay a heavy price for being last across the line. None of that stopped her from frantically trying to reroute the power systems she knew were about to go up like a volcano full of gunpowder. Her hands flew over the controls at Oxcon 4, one of the power matrices constructed closer to the center axis of the ship. She had activated the blast hatches around her little mechanical sanctuary and taken the extra few moments to rig up a triple-redundant wired channel to the bridge in the event radio communications were cut off. 
Unfortunately, so far she hadn't heard a sound over that channel. The lights went out for the fifth time. She grabbed her shock couch harness with both hands and braced herself. The subsequent crash and metal-tearing lurch in the deck plating shook the small chamber she was in like she was inside a flimsy aluminum storage cabinet being thrown down a flight of steel stairs. Alarms sounded everywhere. Alert signals were being transmitted throughout the ship's systems, and her contact boards all shifted to various shades of red. Engineering to bridge. Nobody answered. Engineering to bridge. Lieutenant Yeely here. Acknowledge. Still, nobody answered. Dominique, this is Yeely Curtis, Chief Engineering Officer of DSS Argent. Identifier Ghost 2946. Match voice print and acknowledge. Acknowledged, Yeely. How can Argent help you today? Report status of this vessel. DSS Argent is at general quarters. Vessel is currently operating at 81% combat effectiveness. Reactors 7 and 8 are offline. There are hull breaches portside on decks 11, 14, 16, and 21. There is a magnesium fire on deck 31 in section 70 approximately. Stop. Report status of bridge personnel. Deck 1 is currently on emergency life support. Medical personnel are responding to reports of casualties. Systems failures prevent any direct contact with the bridge. Who is in command of this vessel? Captain Jason Hunter was last known to be in command of DSS Argent. What is his status? Unknown at this time. A cold shot of adrenaline landed in Lieutenant Curtis's hips. She knew the risks of war better than most personnel aboard, but she also knew what the dreamy detachment of experiencing the worst felt like. It didn't help she was practically isolated in one of the smallest rooms on the ship. She keyed her comlink. Yili to Moo. Static. Yili to Moo. Come in. Silence. Lieutenant Curtis's cursed through gritted teeth. Dominique, are you in contact with any of the senior officers? Negative. Understood. Since I cannot establish contact with any of the senior officers either, I am assuming command of this vessel. Acknowledged. Senior Lieutenant Yilly Curtis now in command of DSS Argent. Note the time in the ship's log and raise Skywatch on Flight 2. Affirmative. Coding your message. Yilly took a moment to reconfigure the engineering command system to feed her console with the relevant status updates from the other subsystems in and around the Argent. Primary among her priorities was life support, which she discovered, to her considerable relief, was still functioning at 95% capacity. I have Skywatch on subchannel J9 switching comnets. Affirmative. Skywatch to engineering. Come in. Engineering Lieutenant Yeely here. What is your status, Skywatch? I, ma'am. About a dozen missile strikes impacted Argent's port quarter. The first wave knocked out our screens. The second wave inflicted critical damage on our transmitters and point defense batteries. Alert 3 reports they have engaged Kilo X-Ray 1 bearing 290, range 2 million kilometers. Very well, Skywatch. Does Bridge have control of the helm? Negative. The independent Navicomp activated and put the Argent at station keeping when the bridge went dark. We're stopped in space, ma'am. Understood. I'm engaging emergency overrides. Engineering has the helm. Stand by for a starboard pivot maneuver. What is the status of our main batteries and flight decks? Main batteries are operational. Flight 1 reported a fire on deck approximately four minutes ago. We haven't been advised of their status. Flight 2 and Flight 3 are both fully operational. Very well. Prep emergency alert squadrons from both rails. Energy weapon loadouts. Advise me on jet's request. Acknowledged, Lieutenant. Skywatch out. Dominique, raise Nemesis 8 on scrambled data link. Affirmative. Coding your message. Yili switched her console to navigational control and pulled up a tactical view of Gitarn Sector 8. It was just as she suspected. Kilo X-Ray 1 had veered off following its successful missile attack and in the process had drawn Alert 3 out of position. Nemesis 8 was still on station and doing her job, which was likely the only reason Argent hadn't been hit with a second salvo. She quickly combined the tactical report with the firing arcs of Argent's weapons and confirmed her pivot maneuver just might work. Now all she needed was the power. Fortunately, she just happened to be sitting near four rather large fusion reactors, none of which were damaged or offline. After a few seconds of rerouting power, she had two fully energized rail cannon with both forward and starboard firing arcs. Now she needed a target. Lieutenant, I have Nemesis 8 on subchannel K5. Perfect. Nemesis 8, this is Lieutenant Yeely in engineering, acknowledge. Affirmative, Argent, we copy.
We are about to perform a reverse starboard pivot and bring our main rail cannon batteries to bear on hostile target Kilo X-Ray 1. Our battle computers are offline. I need a firing solution, and I need you to paint my target. Affirmative, Argent. Stand by. Yili watched as the chaotic real-time tactical display suddenly went from a snowy, distorted mess to a crystal-clear view of everything in the sector right down to the designation on Argent's hull. Apparently Nemesis 8 had launched a couple look-down probes when nobody was paying attention. This gave the fleet little ship a bird's-eye view of everything happening in and around the action. And, since Nemesis 8 was on Argent's side, it gave the battleship crew an equally clear view of local space. One thing any electronic warfare ship always made provision for was its own view of the battle space. Jamming the enemy is generally a good idea. Jamming yourself in the process was almost never a good idea, since there weren't many advantages to having an effective fighting force if nobody knows what the hell is going on or where anything is. The Nemesis Corvettes were designed to produce asymmetric interference. They were practically invisible to enemy vessels. They could just about make themselves look like a three-ring circus tent at ranges as close as half a kilometer if they had the power available. They were also equipped with everything they needed to defeat their own signals so they could keep their motherships in the loop with real-time updates on where the bad guys were and how fast they were moving. And if a nemesis ship was tough to find, their look-down probes were nigh unto impossible. The little-winged cameras were quasi-intelligent automatic evasive action machines. Tracking them down was like trying to catch a greased chicken with a cloaking device and a camera to take unflattering pictures of you while it runs you ragged. By the time they were called on by Lieutenant Curtis, Nemesis 8 had deployed a half-dozen such probes. If what was going on in Sector 8 was a sporting event, the EW Corvette was basically controlling enough automatic equipment to turn the battle into a Monday night football telecast. The only thing missing was Howard Cosell. Meanwhile, what was immediately apparent to the Argent's chief engineer was that Alert 3 was distracting enough to the enemy cruiser that it wasn't going to be in position in time to fire a second salvo. But that was going to be true only if Yili was able to pull off her pivot maneuver in the next 20 seconds. The battle looked and felt like three small dogs chasing a carnivorous giraffe, but it was the best Argent could muster at the moment. Nemesis 8 has your target bearing 286 Mark 17, relative range 2.12 million miles. Synchronize manual targeting to key Baker Echo Papa Victor 1448. Acknowledge. Lieutenant Curtis scrambled to pull up the manual targeting interface in time to copy her spotter's directions. She hesitated a moment, trying to remember how to manually synchronize the targeting system. Somehow she managed to recall the rusty instructions from memories of late-night hacking sessions at her Yellow Jacket controls, driving her squadron commanders crazy with unauthorized reconfigurations of the flight deck computers. Finally, after a half-dozen rejections and errors, the manual system synchronized and began following Nemesis 8's telemetry. Acknowledged, Nemesis 8. Targeting control at your command. Stand by for weapons lock. Yili pulled up a more familiar interface. Her engines. In a matter of moments, she had engaged the engineering overrides and taken a crude control of Argent's helm by simply alternating engine power. The mighty ship nudged itself into motion, backing away from the enemy contact. Yili throttled the port engines in reverse and engaged the starboard engines forward. Gradually, the firing arcs for the two main weapons batteries she had energized had rotated far enough to bear on the enemy target. When the overlay for the second rail cannon switched from amber to green, she keyed her subchannel. Nemesis 8 rail cannon are bearing on hostile target Kilo X-Ray 1. Lock weapons and stand by. A moment passed. The enemy cruiser continued to bank, exchanging fire with the bobbing and dodging little craft chasing it. Affirmative, Argent. We have a waveform lock and a bearings match on target Kilo X-Ray 1. Fire control at your command, ma'am. Far from Yili's station on Deck 29 next to Auxcon 4, the enemy cruiser was turning back in Argent's direction with a second barrage of deadly anti-ship missiles locked on the enormous battleship. For reasons none would have been able to explain, all the interference in the sector had disappeared in a split second, leaving the enemy vessel with a wide-open 5x5 frequency lock on the larger ship's space traffic ILS beacon. There were some anomalous readings, but the enemy fire control mistakenly concluded it was due to residuals from the previous interference. It didn't realize it was an invisible electronic warfare corvette providing range and position data to their target.
The first rail cannon shot missed, but the subspace disruption didn't. The flash from the passing projectile caused all of the cruiser's polarization systems to reflexively darken its external facing ports. By the time the cruiser's automatic systems realized they were under attack, they had no time to evade the second shot, nor did they realize Yili had echeloned her weapons in a continuous firing cycle. The second shot ricocheted off the cruiser's dorsal engine cowlings, slamming against already weakened armor and reigniting the fire's damage control parties had fought to control ever since the torpedo attack. The cruiser stumbled, but continued to close range with Argent, waiting for the moment when it would reach optimal range for another missile barrage. Yili waited patiently, living up to her brief reputation, except now she was a girl with some rather larger guns than before. She maintained her weapons and their synchronization with Nemesis 8's sophisticated targeting computers. Rail Cannon 3 finished reloading, snapshotted the targeting data and fired again, lighting up space for hundreds of thousands of kilometers. The deuterium slug punctured the cruiser's secondary hull through and through, blasting a cloud of mangled circuitry, armor and metal fragments into space. The cruiser began to skid as a secondary explosive decompression event overthrusted the vessel's port side. This gave T-Hawk 6 a magnificent target against its already damaged ventral engine superstructure. Lieutenant Abi opened up with his brawler cannons again and began landing punch after overloaded punch into the largest chink in the besieged vessel's defenses. Fires re-erupted and secondary explosions started to answer the lightning-fingered impacts of white-hot plasma energy one after the other. Seconds later, the vessel performed its final maneuver, attempting to bank away while protecting its vulnerable port side. Argent's rail cannons both chose the exact same target bearings. Twin slugs, each roughly the size of a Welpy 2 diesel submarine, ripped through the cruiser's center of mass at appreciable percentages of light speed. The resulting detonation blew the forward section of the cruiser clear moments before a secondary explosion vaporized her engines. Alert 3 veered in all directions and spiked their escape jets to reach a safe range. Argent's fifth shot was a pinpoint impact on the enemy ship's fusion assembly, there was a brief sunbright nova of explosive energy and then only debris-strewn darkness remained. Chapter 19 Notify Flight 2 and Flight 3. I want an Alpha Strength Strike Force on a 15-minute alert as soon as possible. Affirmative, Lieutenant. Skywatch out. Yili unlatched her shock harness, drew her blaster pistol and went to the hatch. She had just about finished configuring her life support alarm and comlink when the sound of a fist pounding on the outside metal almost made her jump out of her boots. The fist pounded again. Is anyone in there? Curtis thought the voice sounded familiar, but after what she had been through the last hour, she wasn't about to take any chances. She leaned close to the hatch, her blaster at the ready. Identify yourself. Room service. Yili tried to keep herself from smiling. I didn't order anything. Sorry, Lieutenant, I thought you said you wanted some earplugs. She unlocked the hatch and Moose stepped through. He had burn marks on his armor and Yili instantly noticed his weapon was down to 15% reserve energy. Smudges and soot residue covered his chiseled face, but he still managed a grin. You've been through hell. That's affirmative, Engineer. We've still got intruders on Deck 31, but they're pinned below the vital energy conduits for Reactor 6. They got two of our fusion plants and cut power to all the control systems above Deck 6 just before the missile attack. It couldn't have been timed better. Any contact with the bridge yet? Yili asked with concern in her eyes. Negative. To be honest, the only people I've had a chance to talk to in the last hour have been wounded marines and medics. Sickbay set up a triage in the machine shop loading area on Deck 19. Then you need to take command, sir, Yili said in a matter-of-fact tone. I've got a boarding party to neutralize, Lieutenant. Are you sure there aren't any officers reachable? The bridge has been cut off since the first missile impact. I'm in nominal command because, frankly, I couldn't find anyone who outranks me until now. You stay in command, Lieutenant. You know the ship a hell of a lot better than me. I'll make sure you get to the bridge or at least some place where you can run things until we figure out what happened on Deck 1. Moo keyed his mic. Dog block, this is Chuck Wagon, brass secured. Rendezvous at Point Indigo, confirm. A moment passed. Confirmed, Chuck Wagon, dog block out. Moo hefted his weapon. Let's go join the party, Lieutenant. I'll take point. You cover. Anything to get out of this phone booth for a few minutes. Chapter 20 
A few minutes later, a dozen members of Dog Block were escorting the Argent's chief engineer to the deck, 29 Magneto lifts. The ad hoc Marine Defensive Unit had been formed by the Major from the unwounded strays and mongrels he managed to scavenge after the Oxcon 7 explosion. Damage above and below the strike point had prevented reinforcements from helping the stranded soldiers directly, so the Major had ordered the men he could find to cut their way through to the lower deck and fight their way back to the lifts. It was the long way around, and it was dangerous, but they had finally joined up with a squad of fresh rifles without sustaining any further casualties. Now that they had access to the lifts, they could form a perimeter and isolate the threat. Muda Bridge That's not going to work until we can restore power above Deck 6. Yili sighed. How long will that take? No clue from here. I have to see what they did first. My guess is the damage control parties can't restore the connections because the intruders found their way into one of the automatic routing subsystems. Until I get up there and switch the system back to manual routing, they're on emergency power only. That plus the fact the anti-intruder system is off controls presents us with a number of related problems. One of the escorting marines punched the code in for the magneto lifts. What about their personal comm links? A fresh-faced young PFC asked. Mu raised an eyebrow. Uh, ma'am. The PFC added quickly, Power levels private. Argent has been jamming everything except wired connections. Since they set off that firecracker in Ox 7, so have the intruders, Yili replied. I'm sure Zoni is up there trying to make it work right now, but without those subsystems, she just doesn't have the horsepower yet. Where to, Lieutenant? Mu asked as the gantry gate opened. Skywatch STC. If we can't get to the bridge, we'll have access to most of the command functions from there. Chapter 21 the magneto lift opened into a scene of abject chaos. The observation deck outside STC command was nearly covered in scoring, scorch marks, and impact points. Flashes of weapons fire were going off inside the darkened control room. Mu gave the rest of his squad an abrupt hand signal, and the Marines advanced on the access hatch. Forward and aft of the starboard side bulkhead, Yili could see the sweeping dorsal surface of Argent's hull. She felt a little twinge of pride when she noticed rail cannons 3 and 4 were still oriented for an off-starboard shot. It was pretty clear at this point they may have been the difference. A debris cloud and intermittent venting atmosphere were occasionally visible over the leading edge of the port quarter. From this vantage point, Yili could see the superstructure of the bridge, but at this angle it was hard to make out any details or possible damage. She did note all the forward running lights were still dark. She cursed the fact she couldn't get forward far enough to evaluate the problem. The fact remained DSS Argent was badly wounded. Lieutenant Curtis felt the difficult-to-ignore urge to get out there and evaluate the damage, everything else be damned, but she also knew the ship needed stable command and control. Without it, they were defenseless, and based on the events of the last hour, she was fairly certain there were more attack cruisers out there. If the next one arrived at the wrong time, it could make the situation dramatically worse in a hurry. Two heavily armed marines bracketed the hatch while two more took up head-on positions, ready to fight their way into the room if need be. The STC control room had become unsettlingly quiet in the few moments since their arrival, as if whomever was inside was preparing for something. Mu moved up and keyed his command access code into the small control console. The lights shifted from amber to green and the hatch opened. Argent Marines acknowledge. Silence. Argent Marines. Mu looked to Yili and she nodded. He signaled his men to advance. The two at the door moved inside and took up defensive positions with side-to-side -side fields of fire. The two head-on riflemen advanced quickly and secured lines of sight. Clear. Clear. The Major rolled around the edge of the bulkhead and stood the doorway, TK-40 at the ready. Nobody home, sir. And I Yili was getting that feeling something was just off enough that it didn't make sense. She had just ordered Skywatch to ready a strike force on the flight deck. There was weapons fire. Where did everyone go? I don't like it, Moo. I gave this station orders ten minutes ago. Correction, Lieutenant. You gave me orders ten minutes ago. Moo whirled. Yili felt the cold business end of a blaster pistol press against the side of her head. The voice behind her spoke in a commanding tone. Weapons down, gentlemen, or I'll vaporize the lieutenant's head and most of this deck with it. Standing behind Yili in a somewhat dilapidated Marine colonel's uniform was a man that looked to be at least in his sixties. He wore a fancifully styled mustache and had thin, slicked-back gray hair. 
His eyes were small and gleamed with menace. That was not a request, Major. This entire facility is wired. If I don't activate the dead man switch in my coat pocket in 20 seconds, you'll have a front row seat to the biggest explosion since the Gatern primary went Nova. The Major looked like he was weighing his options right up to the point when the Colonel announced there were explosives wired into the STC control facility. Stand down, Marines, Moo said coldly. His arms relaxed and he let his weapon drop. After placing it on the floor, he rose back to his full height and glared at the colonel. The rest of his men reluctantly followed his lead. You too, Lieutenant. Yili carefully placed her blaster on the deck, making sure it was within reach in case things got dicey. What's this all about, colonel? Moo challenged, putting a particular sarcastic emphasis on their opponent's supposed rank. And this is about a young crew that doesn't seem to want to listen. I warned you to stay away. I told you this sector was a trap but you wanted to do things your own way. Now you're tangled up in this and you're going to have to pay your own freight to get out of it. The man pulled an electronic detonator out of his pocket and clicked the dead man switch. That buys us another 60 seconds. Colonel, if you'll kindly lower your weapon, I will promise you no tricks. Very well, Lieutenant, the Colonel replied calmly. No tricks. He relaxed, pistol in one hand, detonator in the other. Yili backed away a few steps and stood near the Major. What do you mean, tangled up in this? What are we tangled in? What you're experiencing here, Lieutenant, is what happens when two opposing groups are in charge of the same military operation. The Dunkirk wasn't sent here to show the flag. Admiral Hughes was out here to make pretended peace overtures. His real orders were to mine the reach side of Gatern sectors 8 and 10 and try to lure the enemy's strength into it. A sneak attack? Mu exclaimed. Why start a war against a superior force? Because they won't be superior anymore if the minefield goes off, boy, the colonel shouted. Everything was going according to plan until some hand-wringing, apron-wearing busybody at Skywatch Command took Hugh's cover orders seriously and declared him overdue. Then you geniuses show up with your big, shiny battleship ready to make a name for yourselves. If enemy command sees you here without a good explanation, they'll think Hughes is up to something, and it will blow the whole operation straight to hell. Then it was you who fired on a Skywatch vessel, sir? Yili asked. You tried to blow up two of my reactors? You had to be stopped. Mu wasn't buying a word of it. There was something else going on here, and he was bound and determined to get at it one way or another. Colonel, where is this enemy fleet of yours? So far we've seen one ship. An old automated hull with a set of pre-programmed drills plugged into its Navicomp and battle computer. You saved us the trouble of disposing of it. The colonel clicked his dead man switch again. That old hull almost took our port quarter off, Yilly snapped. That's an act of war, sir, no matter what your rank or your supposed orders. Grow up, Lieutenant. I didn't come all the way out here to listen to your idealistic accusations or your histrionics about who hit who first. The older officer gestured in the direction of Barker's asteroid. The strike force on the opposite side of that asteroid field is anchored by twelve heavies, including four carriers. When they move on Corps' edge, there will be fifteen billion lives at stake and that's a hell of a lot more important than a new paint job. Now I'm going to ask you this one time, Major, as I'm presuming you are in charge of this little field trip. Are you going to join the winning side or not? Moo's face darkened. The colonel stared right back at him. If not, I'll just drop this switch down the lift shaft and let eight tons of explosives solve your problem for you. Chapter 22 What's it going to be, Major? The edge in the as-yet-unidentified intruder's voice was unmistakable. Even Yili could tell the man was in a rush for some reason. His face looked drawn and his fingers were white around the grip of his blaster pistol. I can't speak for the entire ship, Colonel. I'm not in command. Well then, who is? At that moment, a faint greenish glow appeared all across the Colonel's body. It flickered and shifted back and forth a few times before focusing bright and sharp. It was a targeting matrix. The intruder looked down at his shoes and pants. What the? By now he was covered in a pattern of two-inch square glowing green targeting lines. From somewhere nearby, Yili and Moo felt and heard sympathetic vibrations in the floor and walls. The nearby observation window darkened. That's a drive field, Yili muttered. A moment later, the unmistakable sleek lines of a two-gen yellow jacket fighter rose into view outside the Skywatch Access Bay observation port. It was roughly the size of three racing boats parked side by side, and the sharp leading edges of its weapons emplacements made it look like an angry metal bird of prey. 
On its forward edge was the proud emblem of Argent Squadron 4, the Tiger Sharks. At its controls was Captain Jason Hunter. A blinding green targeting laser illuminated the shocked colonel's face and then performed a mass and position scan of his entire body. The fighter's short range guns rolled out of their inboard weapons bays and locked into place. The targeting grid reflected from the colonel's jacket and clothing shifted red. Hunter's voice came over the intra-ship. I believe I have you covered, Colonel. The intruder did not speak. He looked as if he were trying to catch his breath. Major, relieve the Colonel of his weapon and take him into custody. Mu activated his comlink. All due respect, sir, he's holding a detonator. It was a bluff, Mu. He's just trying to buy himself time. His co-saboteurs have been cut off, and we've got some fascinating information about the little operation going on all the way out here at Shangri-La. Chapter 23 Zoni, Mu, Yili, and Anora were seated in Captain Hunter's inboard cabin once again. This time, they looked a little less awestruck and a little more determined to get to the bottom of whatever was happening to their ship. All four officers were armed with blaster pistols, and Mu was still wearing the wrist appliques from his power armor. They were engaged in a boiling discussion over what went right, what went wrong, and just who exactly they should consider their enemy. Attention on deck, Moo snapped. All four of the bandit jacks rose to academy-perfect postures. As you were, Captain Hunter said quickly. He was also armed, and the look on his face told the others this meeting was at least going to start all business. Be seated. Hunter placed a tablet on the conference table. Behind him, the crystal projection screen was displaying the Argent emblem and vessel designation. The letters spelling out the ship's name were at least a foot tall. Our visitors have been pinned on deck 34 for several hours. Dr. Doverly has assured me they will not be permanently harmed by the introduction of a narcotic compound through the life support systems. Lieutenant Simpkins has been instructed to give them another 30 minutes. What are they holding out for, sir? Moo asked, genuinely interested in why a dozen men would barricade themselves on someone else's ship and still expect to prevail. That falls into our other subject of discussion. Apparently, there's a little more going on out here than an overdue ship. A lot more, Honora added. Colonel Atwell hasn't been very helpful yet. Although his stories about dead man switches and tons of explosives were certainly entertaining, they didn't give us much in the way of clues regarding his involvement. Yili was drawing little imaginary circles on the table. Her posture made her look like a teenage girl, listening to her parents lecture her about getting a job. We should have listened to the doctor, sir. Hunter stopped and considered his lieutenant's words. Go ahead, engineer. I called this meeting for opinions. We knew sabotage was a clear threat. We didn't do enough to prepare. It cost me two men and it just about cost us the ship. It wasn't your fault, Yili, Honora said gently. I'm not trying a sign or avoid blame here, ma'am. I'm just pointing out we all got caught flat-footed. I don't know the ship's systems well enough. That cost us critical time that put more people in danger. They were one step ahead of us the entire time, Moo said. Even the colonel and his stories about poison gas and the fake light show in Skywatch got me to at least think about striking a deal to save whatever was left. It was my fault, Zoni said. We froze down communications too soon. By the time we realized the whole thing was going sideways, it was too late to restore our emergency channels. And then the bridge got cut off and I... Hunter held up his hand. Zoni quieted down and shrank back into her seat. If there's any blame to be laid here, it's mine and mine alone. I'm the captain of this ship. I'm responsible for the lives of every man and woman aboard, and I'm responsible for the safety and survival of this vessel. Yilly? The engineer looked up, recognizing that peculiar tone Jason Hunter was capable of that told her he was about to say something heartfelt and important. We lost two men in engineering, but you saved almost a thousand lives by your quick thinking. The best way we can honor the memory of those two men is to avoid making the same mistake twice. Yili nodded. And to go pay our friends a little visit, Mu added. I've got a couple of ideas in that department, Colonel, Hunter replied. Moo looked up with a shocked expression. The captain tossed him a metal box. He almost fumbled it before catching it with both hands. Orders came through right after we hit the Gitarn jump gate. Skywatch Command moved you up after I requested you for Argent. Congratulations. I... I don't know what to say, sir. Tell me what you think about promoting our chief engineer soon, Hunter said. 
I think something should be done to recognize her. Shall we say, innovative approach to command? Hunter grinned and Yili smiled a little despite herself. What action's been taken? The captain asked, reclining in his tall leather chair.